Welcome to the Clean Truth, where we like to call bullshit on the status quo. What's up? Welcome back to the Clean Truth. I'm Don Silver Fox. Yes, sir. Coach, that's Ben's nickname now. I don't know if you knew that. But... I didn't know that. Still, still got the hair though, Coach. So it's all good. It's <laughs> good. It's good. Great we have hair. we have a really cool guest on the show today. I'm looking forward to this one simply because we've interviewed a few of my mentors on the show before. We've never interviewed any of your former bosses, mentors, think guys that you've looked up to. So I'm I'm and I'm a baseball guy. So we have Coach Mike Bianco from Old Miss Baseball. How you doing, Mike? I'm doing good, Don. How are you? Thanks for having me. Good. This is gonna be awesome. This is gonna be fun. Pumped. Before we get into it, we always try to thank Rain and Monster Energy for keeping us caffeinated here at the office. Uh Brett, thank you. You always take care of us. This week's ball busting. Man, I, I don't even know how to. I can top he, coaches. He already he just, started before we even. We weren't got even into recording yet, and he told Ben that my arms were twice the size. Of you made my day, Coach. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. For my view here, you know, uh, it's it's not even close. But uh, but but again, you know, maybe it's on Zoom. It's a, a, maybe it's just angles. Huh, Fleming? It's just angles. It's just angles. But I will now hear about this for the next thirty days. Yeah, you, you ain't living this one for a while. <laughs> All right, this week's clean truth, Coach. Every week we do a, what we call a clean truth, and it's it's usually geared towards fitness, nutrition, business, uh, things like that. And it's just a chance for people to ask us questions, and then we answer them on the show. And the one I've I've kind of sat on this one for a while because I didn't really know how to do it, but this was a perfect intro. And and somebody asked me a while back when I when I do this online, who my favorite coach was in sports growing up. And, uh, you know, for me, I'll go first. My, for me, it was my wrestling coach, quite frankly, because he was a hard ass. He yelled at us. I mean, he basically demoralized you. And and, and, and no, sh- I don't even know how to, another word for it, but that's basically what it was. But And, and I mean, you liked that and that became your favorite? So- I mean, now I do. When I was in high school, I hated it. I hated the man, literally. Me and him butted heads so bad because I, I have, don't agree with that. But – um. I don't do well with that. Let's say that. Um, but looking back on it, I, I, I can appreciate his reasoning for doing it. Now that I'm a, I'm a grown man, and he he was probably my favorite coach. Like it, mine was probably high school soccer coach. He uh, he cut me from the freshman like tryouts, so I never made the freshman team, JV team, or varsity team my first year of high school soccer. But then uh, he became one of my mentors, and I became a captain my senior year everything like that so probably taught me a lot of you know life lessons right there with um you know failure from the start but um yeah definitely one of the mentors for me coach so ben, yeah. but ben you were uh so you were like michael jordan you got cut from the team and yeah. then you came back and showed him we're in north carolina coach you can't put me on the same level as michael jordan <laughs> <laughs> but yeah um well do, do i go with this don too yes sir yep uh well, I don't think there's any doubt. I know Ben's going to know who I'm about to say is, you know, my favorite coach and the guy that's impacted my life more uh, uh, than anyone. And I've had some great coaches, uh, you know, through through the years in high school and junior college. And uh, but but Skip Bertman, uh, who uh, for your listeners that aren't baseball fans or don't follow college baseball, you know, Skip Bertman is the you know the John Wooden or more contemporary the Nick Saban you know, of college baseball, you know, arguably the greatest college baseball coach uh, of all time uh, was my coach at LSU. I, pl- I played at LSU. I was a junior college transfer. And so I, I played a couple of years uh, junior college baseball in Florida. And then uh, my last two years, my junior and senior year at LSU, uh, back in the olden days, back in 88 and 89, and uh, Bertman had been got to LSU, I believe, in 1984, uh, and then retired in 2001. So it wasn't, and that was his only coaching head coaching stint. You know, so 18 years, but what a great 18 years! And through the decade of the 90s, um, you know, Skip Bertman won uh, five national championships in 10 years. And so I was fortunate to not only play for him in the late eighties, as I mentioned, but also came back as an assistant coach, uh, for five years and was there for part of the three, uh, part of 
three national championships. So uh, just uh, a great coach, great mentor, learned so much, you know, about the game and about life as probably if you delve into more of what you guys are saying, when you talk about coaches, uh, you know, it probably wasn't a wrestling move or, you know, some type of, you know, soccer technique, you know, surely you learn that, but that's not what endears you, I think, to the athletes. It's the stuff that when you wake up, you know, and as you said, Don, right, like you didn't love them then, but there's a reason that you love them now and then yeah. you're mentioning it on the air is because he affected your your life in, a, in another way. So, you know, it wasn't the, the fireman's carry, the single leg technique that he sure. taught you. Right. You know, those were great, but there were some other things that you're, you're using in your life. And uh, and that's what great mentors do. No doubt. Awesome. Well, let's just jump into some some coaching based off that question. You know, talk about the year this year. This was a, a, a decent year for you guys. Uh, these decent, uh, uh, kind of a, uh, uh, a, I wouldn't probably call it decent. I thought it was a really good year, but I appreciate that. Uh, uh, but, uh, no, it we was, didn't know. It was, we didn't know how you would react to it. I, I was he, he was asking, for that question. He was I, asking me. He's like, <laughs> he's like. So, how does he consider this year? I'm like, I. Well, he considers them all different. But uh, we were talking about yeah. we were talking and, about and was, too earlier. Yeah, you know, you're you're right. And 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 you know, one of the things that's tough in all of athletics, right, is usually you know everybody's going to lose their last event, their last game, their last contest. Is you know, uh, except for the team that wins a national championship. And so, you know, it's always tough when it ends. And uh, and certainly to end in game three of a super regional, uh, you know, a game away from making it to the College World Series, uh, you know, that it's it leaves a little, you know, bit, not a little, a, a big bitter taste in your mouth uh, because that's the ultimate goal is to get to the World Series and win a national championship. Uh, and so when it ends, it's tough. But I think as as happens in life, as you kind of get away from it, as, as time, you know, heals all wounds as we hear, right. Uh, you know, you start to reflect back and see, you know, what a, what a neat year it was, what a cool year it was. Um, this was a year that, you know, we started the season ranked anywhere from probably, you know, fifth to 10th, fifth to eighth. And then, and the national polls got off to a great start, went three and O over in Texas in the sec big 12 challenge and beat Texas, uh, Texas tech and TCU, um, uh, all three teams that ended up becoming national seats, you know, which means they finished in the top eight in the country and were able to host not only regionals, but super regionals. Um, but then, you know, this team hit a lot of adversity. And uh, we, we had over 10 players that missed over a month or more uh, and significant players, guys like Tim Elko, who was the national hitter of the year or national hitter of the month, the month, national hitter of the month for the month of March on April uh, 3rd or 4th uh, towards ACL and was out for a month. Mm. And then there's a legendary, if you follow Ole Miss mm. baseball, where he came back and ended up hitting seven more home runs um, and leading us to postseason. Uh, but still, as much as I love t uh, Tim and, and, and as cool as the story is, he was still a shell of himself that he was. You know, he's a guy with a knee brace, you know, that couldn't run and could only hit, couldn't play position, DH'd, and we ran for him, you know, his last at bat. Uh, but what a what a great captain, what a great leader. Uh, but other guys like Gunnar Hoagland, arguably, you know, maybe the best college pitcher, certainly a top five pick in, in this, you know, year's major league draft, um, uh, gets hurt, misses the last five starts uh, uh, and, and others, uh, throughout the year that, uh, miss significant times. And so, uh, it's amazing. We get to the end of the year and we talk about all the adversity. And so we talk about injuries. We talk about this happened, that happened. And man, th this was the COVID year. <laughs> we yeah. don't even talk about that anymore. Right. I mean, th this team had to do things that, uh, you know, other teams before them, like, the rest of the 300 division one schools, but not only did we have to navigate through the COVID uh, protocols and all those things of not being able to be in the locker room, you know, together in the fall where we had to 
put shifts where guys would come in and out, have to have actually operation guys or managers, almost like a head count. Like how many guys are in a locker room? How many guys are leaving? Okay, two guys left, two guys can come in. Uh, From all the testing and all the other things that you have to do, weightlifting, right, Ben, where we couldn't have everybody in the weight room at one time. We could only have 15 at a time, which is so different than the way we run, you know, our program. So, so many different things with COVID, so many different injuries, and for them to win 45 games, uh, for them to go 18 and 12 in a number one baseball conference in a country, to host a regional, uh, to, to make it to game three of a super regional, where, you know, I think most people thought we had a really good shot. We don't play well, they play well, and then a really good Arizona team makes it to the World Series. So I think when I step back, you know, I'm really proud. You know, it wasn't the ending that we wanted, uh, but this team was, was special in a lot of different ways. For sure. Yeah, we're sitting here looking at um, – we have the uh, stadium pulled up, the Old Miss baseball site, and uh, your catcher won the gold glove. Yeah, that's terrific. Cool. You know, cool. the Hayden Dunhurst, uh, you know, an in-state product that's uh, sensational and likely to be a first-rounder, you know, next year. And we've had a lot of really good, you know, catchers come through the program, as, as Ben knows, and, uh, you know, but, uh, uh, you know, Hayden's been sensational and he's in his second year. It's, it's tough. We don't even know what to say. Is it his sophomore year or his COVID freshman year? Yeah, that's or, How know, long so. is that going to take to like transition out? Yeah, you, don't have, out. you don't have to well, like phrase the athletes like that. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, it's, it's tough. And, and, and I think, you know, I think basically the, the, the easy answer is it'll take four years, you know, because when you look at the classes, you know, we have, two freshman classes. We have you know, Dunhurst's class where he was a freshman in 2020, you know, but only played 16 games. And as both of you know, the NCA, um, uh, one of part of the relief uh, was to not count that as a year of eligibility, not a red shirt, not just kind of like null and void. We're not counting that year. Uh, we're not going to penalize a kid and, and use that as a red shirt year. Cause that kid may need to use that somewhere down the line or yeah. may have already used it. Right. And so for all the athletes, they got that year back. Um, but you know, that was, you know, our, we had had the number two ranked recruiting class in the country. And so that was a very big class, freshman class that came in that year. So it would have been freshman in 2020. Well, you don't count. So they to really freshmen again, but now you have in 2021, a whole nother freshman class. And what, you know, everybody has their story about COVID, but you know, the, the quick part about this is, you know, what COVID didn't do was stop time. See, kids graduated from high school, you know, freshmen became sophomores, sophomores became juniors. And so, you know, these recruiting classes continue to move up and, you know, filtrate the the, the program. Uh, but we didn't get any more scholarship. We didn't get any, you know, you know uh, all we got was another year of eligibility. So to Ben's question, you basically, for us, we have two freshman classes that are on, you know, track to graduate at the same time. And, uh, and, and so everybody's you know trying to navigate that. We're not the only ones. Seems like a massive headache on a daily basis. Do you think that's your biggest? That was one of my questions. So, do you think that that was that is the biggest challenge from COVID for for college? From, from an athletic standpoint, I mean, I, I'm sure athletic directors would talk about um, you know the funding and the budgets and all of that because that's a whole nother issue of how do you how do you navigate through this and uh not just pay salaries but remember you're paying scholarships right you know and you know which is the biggest component of most at most athletic budgets is 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 this the scholarships and uh and 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 not just the coaches salaries but you know the the, the people that are in administration the secretaries the you know the the people that you know clean the buildings everybody all you know, we have you know close to 300 employees in you know, the university of mississippi's athletic you know department and so now you're not generating the revenue and so how do you make those bills how do you pay those bills and so that's probably been the biggest headache for administrators from coach standpoint yes i think it's the managing of the roster you know it's you know to deal with the scholarships the amount of people um and continue to do what you normally do and coach the kids and try to win games but before we get into me asking you some questions about you as a head coach 
talk about some of the things you've told me about the stadium and because now that you have fans back in it was kind of cool for me to I watched you guys a lot with him um through the playoffs and and this year and he's he's told me so much about old miss baseball games and the atmosphere and the ambiance there i bet that was cool to have all the people back i think i had told coach like you grew up a st louis cardinals fan die hard and you know you were there when pool host was there and mcguire and they had the home run race and everything like that well Coach believes in the long ball, and the coolest thing about like Swayze on a national uh, landscape is right field, where the student section is. Um, Coach, you want to talk about kind of how the student section evolved and came about? And I've kind of told Don, I'm like, yeah, this is college baseball. He's come to you know local UNCW games uh, we've watched together, but I'm like, this feels like a big league ballpark in a college setting, so. Yeah. Well, you, you can obviously YouTube it and, and, and go online and see a lot of, you know, still shots and uh, of the stadium full empty. Uh, you can, you know, go on YouTube and, and uh, you know, maybe type into YouTube the Swayze showers uh, to, to exactly <laughs> get what, what, what uh, Ben's talking about. Uh, but uh, I guess just some perspective, you know, our, I think uh, our capacity is around 12,000 people. Um, you know, we average about 9,000 a game, uh, which puts us, you know, maybe second or third in the country. And we've been, you know, in the top five in attendance for probably about the last 15 years. Uh, there's times, you know, there's certain nights and times where we'll outdraw, you know, a major league team, the Miami Marlins or somebody like that. Uh, but it's a really say. cool yeah, it's a really cool atmosphere because it's not, well, 10,000 in a stadium that holds 45,000. It's 10,000 in a stadium that probably has 9,000 seats. And so, uh, and what's unique about Swayze Field is there's there's something for everyone. You know, so when you look at the stadium, it's beautiful. It's, you know, uh, got about 6,500 blue chair back seats where I call them the, the, the hardcore baseball people with the scorecard and watching the game <laughs> in, in the normal stadium um, uh, atmosphere. And then there's a club level that holds uh, just under 900 people that like you're familiar with if you've been to a major league stadium where it's a premium seat, right? So they pay more money. Uh, not only do they get the seat, but they get, you know, special, you know, uh, amenities like food or drink or whatever that comes with, with that. Then out in left field, you have uh, what I call the families. So there are people that, you know, come and buy a area, a rent an area, almost like a parking spot, a tent area. Uh, so it's almost like they're tailgating, but they're at the game where they get a grill, they get a grill, they get a, a space where families will rotate who's cooking on a certain night. Uh, and then back out there, there's a playground for the kids, wall ball area turfed off where they can run around and the parents can sit there and enjoy, you know, a meal, watch the game with their friends and their kids are having fun as well. And then as Ben's mentioning out in right field is our students. And on a given night, we'll have 3000 students out in right field. Think about that for a second. Most people don't draw 3,000 for a game. There was only like 3,000 like 3, at Wingate, Coach. So you can just yeah. throw it. You can throw the Wingate jab in there, too, if you yeah. want to. <laughs> 3,000 out in right field where, you know, people won't even draw 3,000 students for a football game, you know, um, in the Southeastern Conference, 3,000 students. We have 3,000 for a baseball game on a Friday night. And so all the students are out in right field. And I don't know, Ben, to be honest with you, exactly when it started. But at some point, we must have hit a big home run. And when we hit a big home run, the students out in right field that have solo cups filled with their uh, – liquid of choice um, (laughs) would throw that up in the air and all of a sudden it kind of caught on and every time now that we hit a home run at home uh, all 3,000 students are throwing their liquids up in the air and so it's quite a scene and it's become pretty pretty famous around the country so pretty cool that's pretty awesome yeah I don't know where Don would like to sit maybe he'd be a, a a left field type of guy but we had this debate when we had Mike yeah. Myers on last year. Also, want to like venture over to the. Well, you might have to bring him over, Ben, for a weekend and, and three game weekend Friday, Rotate Saturday, it. Sunday, sit in a different spot all three ga- days and let Don figure it out for himself. I like it. I'm in. Well, coach, what do you think was your favorite moment as a head coach? You've been 
doing this for a while. Do you have a favorite moment that you could pick out that was like, yes, this is my favorite moment that I've ever experienced? That's a tough one, you know, and, and uh, those questions, I, I think I always get a little angst from because, you know, you don't want to leave out a moment. Sure. You, 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 I always kind of kick back and go, man, what? I think the easy one would, you know, say in 2014, uh, winning the Super Regional against the number one ranked team in the country, Louisiana Lafayette, and making it to the College World Series, uh, where we hadn't been since 1972. That that was kind of a really cool moment because it was a really good team, our team, playing a you know the best team in the country on the road, uh, kind of a hostile environment, great fan base, you know, there by the Raging Cajuns. Uh, game three. Uh, and it was done by a really you know neat team as well as is as Ben knows, you know, was made up of you know a lot of older guys that have kind of been through it all, been through the gamut of, you know, not making a regional, going to a regional on the road and losing and and uh, and also some really, you know, talented young kids. And so it was a neat mix and it just all kind of came together. Um uh, and, and really in a special moment where we had been so close to making it to the College World Series, you know, several times before, but hadn't. And to, for it to happen, you know, was, was really a, a, a neat, neat moment. But there's, there's individual moments. There was a really cool moment this year uh, when Tim Elko, who we mentioned, tours ACL. Um, and was working hard to come back. And, and a lot of people, including myself, when we first talked about it, him coming back, I, I, I'm, I'm one where I think I, I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm a neutral thinker. You know, I'm not overly positive. I'm not overly negative. Uh, I think I tend to lean to that positive side. I think I'm a positive person, but, you know, I also try to stay in the middle, not because I don't want to get my feelings hurt, it's just because at the end of the day, as a coach, you got to make the right decisions. You can't just make them because you're living in Camelot, right? You got to, you got to make them for the right reasons. And so when we found that. out that Tim had a possibility of coming back, uh, I wasn't sure because, you know, what I was hearing from the doctors is they weren't sure. Uh, but it got to a point where Tim could hit in the game. And uh, and so we pinched hit. Uh, and I believe I'm trying to think uh, who we were playing. Uh, man, this escapes me. Uh, maybe South Carolina. I believe it was South Carolina weekend. Uh, early May. And we pinched hit him. And as he came to the plate on Saturday night, he got a standing ovation, you know, with 10,000 people in the stands. And that was a really cool, like emotional moment. Sure. Uh, because to see the appreciation that our fans had for Tim to, you know, the captain who, you know, had this travesty happen, you know, a month, you know, the, got this year stolen from him, right. That, you know, he had the, he was a national hitter of the year captain and, you know, of a team that was ranked in the top five in the country. And, and, uh, and here he, he's worked himself back to be able to hit and not just kind of pat him on the back, but like, and we thought you now had a shot. And he hit a monster, just missed it, hit a monster fly ball to short center field, but about 500 feet and seemed like in the air. And, of course, he stumbles and tries to get to first base, and he's out. They catch it. But the people never, you know, sat down. They continued to applaud and, and you know, just an effort. And, awesome. and that's, that's what's really cool and neat about sports is, you know, yeah, you can have some people boo and you can have some people upset and you can have people cheer. But then there's sometimes that you, you have those moments where it's just genuine, where you can feel that magic, you know, uh, that everybody agrees, right? That everybody agrees what a cool moment it was and, and uh, to watch his teammates hug him as he came off the field and so on. Uh, so anyway, so I gave you one from eight years ago and I gave you one from two months ago. No, I love it. I'm going to put Ben on the spot here. Do you have a favorite strength and conditioning coach that you've worked through, worked with in the program? Yeah, sure. Uh, our, our current strength right now. <laughs> Rich Levy. <laughs> Let me tell you, I love, uh, you know, I love Ben. And he knows that, that he's touched and changed our program. I said that as a joke, by the way. Uh, I love Zach Boone, and, and it's hard to, to say. But I, I will tell you this. 
you know, Ben changed our program and, uh, you know, uh, and, and we'll ever be remembered here, you know, and, uh, how much I appreciate not only just the hard work and what he's done, uh, but how much he invested, you know, and, and how much he cared. And, uh, yeah, you know, one of the reasons that, you know, we're, we're the program that we are today is because of Ben. And so, uh, and you still consider him a, a, a great friend, uh, uh, we, now, we, now we vacation uh, together. Yeah, I, 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 my wife and I bought a condo on the beach in the same building that his parents, you know. Oh uh, yeah, awesome. live now. So uh, I see him occasionally now, probably more so uh, than maybe I would because he don't ever come visit Oxford. Uh, but uh, but uh, that'll show you, you know, what kind of trust because you know, we're thinking about buying a place, and he said, "Hey, you need to buy a place in my my parents' building." So. We, and six days later, we own the, own the condo. So we, we trust Ben Fleming. Well, he's definitely an asset here. I can tell you that. So yeah. Talk yeah. about, talk, talk about this phenomenal Sornex facility, um, that you have there in the stadium. I've seen it before and it looks phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're right, Don. It, it is. It's, it's, it's the best weight room in the country. And, you know, uh, there's a lot of things that everybody thinks they have the best or, uh, and some of that's a lie. It's not even close to being the best. Sometimes it's okay. It's the best, but you're a little prejudiced because it's your own. So maybe it's in the top five. This is one that's hands down. Nobody will deny this is the best, you know, uh, weight room, uh, baseball weight room in the country. And it, 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 it rivals most football weight rooms. And obviously it's a, it's a baseball program. So kind of the history really quickly about it is in 2009, they expanded our stadium, uh, really because of need we had, had sold out the stadium for straight years and it was there there was a need to build more seats and in doing so uh, like most construction you know projects uh, it cost a lot more after the bid started coming in than they thought it was going to be and so there was a lot of things cut and most of the things that were cut were player amenities and some things underneath and not really because it was wasn't the important thing the important thing was to build more seats at the time but you know then we got to uh uh, got back from Omaha in 2014, and then the plan started to come uh, about of how to address the player amenities, locker room, training room, uh, weight room, because now we were in a part where kind of transitioned the athletic department where um, we were going to lose our, our, our old weight room, which was the old football weight room where the football team now has a football practice facility has their own weight room. We got access to the old one, which was a great scenario for us. Uh, but now we were going to lose that. And so we needed a place to work out. And so um, they, in the interim, we worked out a little bit in the women's facility, worked a little bit in the football facility and kind of where we were nomads for, for about a year. And the, the, the idea was to build a weight room in our baseball performance center. And so the original plans had this weight room, you know, somewhere between nine and 10,000 square feet, you know, great. It's, uh, I think it's got 16 racks, you know, the eight down both sides and uh, uh, even a, uh, which Ben helped, you know, design, uh, had a, uh, a 30 yard track at one end where we could do some speed agility, some dynamic warm up type stuff and a cardio area with, which looked out on the, through a giant window that looks out onto the field. Well, anyway, as the bids started coming back, um, they went into, you know, uh, trying to make some cuts to try to keep it, you know, somewhat closer to, to budget. And part of that was to cut off half the weight room. And, you know, when you start looking around at baseball weight rooms, most of them are in that area of two to 3,000 square feet, right? And, you know, you bring in the pitchers or you bring in the position players, guys come in, you know, kind of like a major league weight room. Well, part of what we do, and Ben knows this, and it's always been my belief is, you know, there's, there's a strength and conditioning part of your program that you want to get the kids, you know, you know, bigger, stronger, faster, and what, you know, makes a lot of sense. But there's also uh, a lot of chemistry, a lot of toughness, a lot of uh, things that as a team build, you know, building exercise that you can kind of put on a Ben Fleming or a strength coach. And that happens in the weight room and it happens in the, in the, in the conditioning. It happens in the things that, uh, you know, the strength and conditioning coach does. And so to be able to, or not, not have them together to me hurts our program. You know, yeah, they can still lift. Yeah, they can still do the same workout, but the hitters never see the pitchers work out. 
right? Uh, the, 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 the infielders may not see the outfielders and, and, and you lose some of that chemistry, some of that toughness, some of the t- team building because they're never in the same room. Their only time they're together is out on the field. And a lot of times when they're out on the field, they're separated, right? Kind of like offense, defense, the pitchers are over here doing their thing. The hitters are over here doing their thing. And, uh, and that was one of the things that Ben was so, uh, so great, so uniquely qualified is putting those guys together and getting those guys to embrace one another through a lot of adversity, you know, through a lot of, you know, things that, you know, they didn't know if they could actually do, uh, but they did it because the coach was telling them to do it. And when they get through it, you know, they're, they're tougher. Uh, there's more chemistry there. They, 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 they're more equipped to handle the adversity that, that our game deals because they were able to do this. So long story short, they wanted to cut the weight room. And I said, well, just take it all out. I don't want it. And they were like, whoa, 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 whoa. what do you mean? I, said, I don't want it. We'll, we'll go to the football one. We'll go, you know, well, I, I'd rather wake up at four in the morning than get a 3000 square foot weight room. Cause it doesn't fit my needs, you know? And, uh, and so That's awesome. uh, we just, we just hung tight with it. And eventually, um, you know, they said, okay, and so they went back and, uh, uh, you know, paid more money, but ended up putting in the weight room that, you know, I think fit our needs as a baseball program. And that's how important strength and conditioning is. We were willing to, to do without any weight room uh, if we weren't going to get the one, because I just thought it was a waste of money. I just thought, you know, it's going to, you're going to, you're going to build this, you're going to have to, you know, furnish it you know, with weights and, you know, it's, it's not going to fit our needs, you know, and I'm going to end up going to the football weight room anyway, you know, it's, you know, it's, you know, not going to fit our needs. So uh, they, they went for it and obviously we're very uh, proud of it and, and super excited that we chose Sornex and, 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 uh, um, you know, a, a short story about that, and I don't even know if Ben knows this, is, you know, when they came to the elevator. deliver, the, yeah, when they came to deliver all the weights because they were on, a, you know, several semi trucks coming our way, uh, the great guys at Sornex, they, uh, they brought them up uh, like three flights of stairs. Oh, I think you uh, told me. Carrying, because the, the elevators weren't operational at that point, and, uh, and I know you know the guys at Sornex, Ben. I forget their names. Or it's yeah, not coming to the- Dan. Dan. Yeah. You know, um, you know. I knew Dan. I've seen Dan work out. Come, you know, when Ben was at our place and work out. I know that he's like, you know, the the maybe the strongest human on the face of the earth. But I <laughs> I even gained another level of respect for him to watch what they did over you know thirty six hours of carrying every single weight in all the racks and all the bars and going up, you know, literally it's probably more than it's two floors, but the floors are like 16, 18 feet. So it's, I don't know, maybe four story, whatever it ends up being, but it's, uh, it's not comfortable walking those steps with nothing in your hand, but to walk all these weights up, um, uh, is amazing. It was an amazing feat. Uh, yeah, a workout that maybe you guys should join in. Exactly. You know, we've moved a few. We've moved a few here. We've moved a few together. It's not, but they still remember that story, Coach. Like yeah. they, they'd still tell people about that story. Le- it's I think, it's it rain, I think it rained too. Correct. It was like <laughs> yeah, mud, it was that. muddy or rain. Yeah. yeah. Those those guys are awesome, man. We I get asked. Yeah. I know I specifically get asked like from other people outside of the people that know us in this room. Like, what's the draw? What's the what, what's your fixation with the guys at Sorenex? Why not Rogue or why not do one of these other companies that are a little bit bigger, a little bigger brand name, a little bit, you know, price point effective. And I'm, I, I have a t- hard time struggling on how to explain that because of those reasons. Like it's almost hard to put into words the culture that those guys have built until you take somebody there or until you take them to one of their events and just let them experience it for themselves. Yeah. I don't even try anymore. I don't. I don't. Yeah. Um, no, they're, they're terrific. And, and so that's one story to show, you know, how, uh, professional they are, that they were going to get the job done regardless. They weren't going to come here and then say, well, Hey, listen, we're out because you know, we're not carrying these up the stairs. Like right. what, what I would think most companies, I probably would, I consider myself excellent. I probably would have said time out. That wasn't the deal. We got an elevator calls back. When you got the elevator, we'll come back. Uh, they didn't do that. They finished the job, but even beyond that, and this is from somebody that's not in the business, right? This is from somebody that did a weight room once and won't ever do another weight room. 
And so if you were to ask me, Don, about the guys from Sornex, we chose them because of recommendations from Ben and other people, but we chose them and, and so happy because that's usually what, what you look at, right? The reviews at every step from the design, uh, what we needed, what, what equipment we needed, um, from the color uh, that everything was going to be, I, you know, Ben will tell you, like, I, you know, I was nervous because, you know, I didn't want to do this. You mess this up. It's, it's there forever. It's not changing. You can't come in and say, you know, hey, now we need to change the rack color. You yeah, know, like it, it, it's a, yeah, it's, it's not happening. And from from every part, from the beginning, from the design to them actually carrying the weights up, uh, they were super professional and we could have never asked for anybody better. Awesome. Well, I can relate following up on what we were talking about. I can really relate to some of the things you were saying, because when when Ben and I first met, that was my instant draw to him and Kyle at the time. And that's why we kind of formed the friendship that we did before he came on to work with us was just the way that he, you know, you were talking about him getting the guys united and getting them together and on the same page and creating that internal culture. And that's, that was an instant draw for me because I had never seen that on my side, like running a business like we have, I've seen other companies attempt it, but it's always failed. And, you know, when I, when I met him and I was going into the weight room and, and, and then I started training with him, I started going to the college and training with the teams and seeing that happen with my own eyes. And then to see it transition to the weight room to out on the field when him and I would go to the baseball games and we'd hang out in the dugout, you can see that you can, it's, it's something that you can actually see with your eyes happen and transition. Sure. So it's, it's really cool. I, I, I love seeing that happen. So I think we're actually we're trying to do that kind of we're right trying now. to do that right now with our own staff and, and do it here because it works and it's just uh it's a cool thing to see well ben's got that that touch and that that, that giant smile and uh uh that's that's infectious and uh and and i think the thing at the end of the day you know as coaches uh that i've learned this and it doesn't matter if strength training or if it's football it's baseball you know um there it's it's not about the X's and O's, you know, you, you can't outsmart them anymore. You know, everybody's going to work hard. The coaches work harder than they've ever have. Um, as far as that technology has helped that uh, immensely. Um, but the difference, the difference that you can, you know, especially in our sport is, is to, to get them to perform, right. To get them to play as a team, you know, those, you know, holding everything else constant, that's the team that's going to win the most. And so, uh, yeah, you can be a strength coach and have devise a, a great, you know, workout and, you know, but at the end of the day, it's, it's, it, how hard are they going to work? How hard are they going to push themselves? How, how much are they invested? That's, that's the coaching. It's not devising the plan. You know, not everybody can do that. I say everybody can do that. Not everybody can do that. But most can do that. But the separator is the team building. The separator is to get everybody committed, you know, to, to the same goals, the same journey, uh, to, to, to build guys that are selfless, that care about one another. Um, and, uh, you know, Ben obviously yeah. is on that wherever he's been. I think, I think that's what we're having a good time doing as a staff right now is, you know, we have people from all different walks of life, like on our staff and, the thing that we're doing with like a workout together just one day a week on the Friday morning, it, it does create that bond and that relationship deeper than just respecting what you do, you know, behind a computer or, you know, with our company and things like that. Like you just bond and grow together so much more by going through adversity and seeing another person sweat like next to you. There's something to be said. Like if you do yard work with your dad and you guys are both sweating, you guys both, you know, walk away from that and, grab a cup of water and say you respect like the work that you just did it's the same thing you know when you do it in a weights together or you're moving you know coolers yep. and furniture together on, sure. a, on a wednesday like we did yesterday you guys just walk away from that and you're like man you know hard work you know brought us closer together you know so well coach i got a couple of leadership things I, I have down on here that i wanted to ask you i've heard a lot of stories from ben uh, being around you and just from what I can gather, you know, we just met today. So what I can gather is your leadership style is something that I know I would adapt to. It, it reminds me of a lot of 
former coaches I've had and former leaders that I've been under that, you know, I don't want to say hard nose. That's really not the right word, but you know, a little, a little rough around the edges and kind of impactful, I guess is the right word. Um, mm-hmm. Have you had to adapt your leadership style as, you know, modern day society grows and changes and evolves? You know, I know for me, guys that I worked with, I was a carpenter for 15 years. So some of the guys that I worked under, and I've told these guys many, many stories about this stuff. Like there were days I drove home crying, literally crying because I got picked on and demoralized. But I love those guys and I appreciate it because at the same time they did that, those are the guys that would pick on you and and make you – feel worthless but then at the end of the day they would take you out and have a beer with you and say hey i was hard on you but this is why and they would tell you why and you would learn from it and grow from it you can't do that anymore let's just call it what it is you can't you can't do the things that was done when i was growing up in in that have you had to change and alter that with coaching throughout time as time goes on sure yeah you know, and, and you're exactly right don i mean it's uh, there, there's still, you know, a segment that you can, you know, be that autocrat to, you can be that demanding guy. You can be that, you know, I'm going to make it really hard on, on them. And, 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 and eventually, you know, we're going to, we're going to hold them down so long. Eventually we're going to let them out. And when we let them out, they're going to be, you know, raven dogs and be able to handle it and all that. that. That's great, but you're right. You know, this is a whole generation, this generation Z, uh, this, the first generation, um, that that we're coaching now that didn't grow up asking their parents questions, right? You know, because they had a phone in their hand and they could Google it and they still do. And we can't answer it better than Google. You know, so so what's our role? So what, what our role is, is not to be the, the information bank, to not be that encyclopedia that, you know, our parents were. But what our role is, is to interpret it and explain how that affects them, you know, to guide them. And, and so it used to be, you know, you know, that you'd ask your parents sit there around one television and ask your parents questions. And, and now, you know, people get frustrated. A kid's got a, a phone in their hand, but that's their life. You know, that's, that's how they grew up. Right. And so, uh, so we have to be careful. You're, you're right. The other thing that you got to learn about this generation Z is they've had it much harder than we have, right? Growing up, their life growing up is much harder. We can say it's easier because you grew in a bigger house or you got a car when you were 16 and all these, you know, things that we think has made their life uh, easier. Uh, And some of that's true, but what we didn't have to deal with was the scrutiny and the pressure. It was to be an athlete, to be a student, to be a boy or a girl, you know, to to have whatever mistake that you make in life be on video or a snapshot and and have people be able to have opinions with that. And that's not just a baseball coach on a message board. No, right. I agree. That's a ninth grade girl sure. wearing the wrong dress to school and it being on Snapchat like people. It is so much more difficult to be a young person now than ever before in this world. And so we have to realize that. So when you take that leadership style where, hey, I'm going to beat them down and I'm going to make them tougher, they've already been beaten down. You know, sometimes they need you to put your arm around. And what, what, I, what I try to find is that happy medium to where it's just about being honest. You know, it's just about when they're doing well, you got to tell them that they're doing well. And when they're not doing well, you got to tell them that they're not doing well, but this is what you need to do to fix it. Because guess what? They're much smarter than us, you know, and much smarter than we used to be. And so, you know, they want to plan. They want to succeed. And so it's all right to, to tell them that this wasn't the way to do it. But the way their mind works is, well, how do I fix it? Sure. Right. And, 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 and it's not just about being tougher. It's not just about getting kicked in the gut. It's about giving them a plan on how to succeed. Um, And so I think that's what's the difference now. So if you ask me, I looked up the leadership and I think the one, you know, the different seven styles of leadership. And I think the one that I'm closest to, and it sounds kind of soft on, is I would say servant leader. And you say, well, well, that means you're just, no, what it means is I'm more hands-on. 
that that I'll help you. I will show you. You know, but it doesn't mean that you're not demanding. You're still a leader. Uh, but I don't think that you know autocratic. You know, just yell. Now Ben will tell you I can yell. Occasionally, I'm not proud of some of the things that come out of my mouth. Um, but I also take pride in not yelling. I also take pride in being able to handle the adversity. And like any good parent, even generations ago, I, I, I think that you have to be careful if you're just yelling and being tough uh, because you lost your temper. That's not good parenting, right? And so not to get into parenting, should you spank your kid or should you put them in timeout, right? That's debatable and it will continue. What's not good is to spank your kid out of anger. Sure. If you're spanking your youngster to change a behavior, you know, uh, to have a, a point to where he'll remember, hey, when I do this, they're not happy and I'm going to get a hand on my rear end. I'm okay with that. Or if it's time out or whatever it is. Uh, but but at, if you're doing it out of anger because you're mad or you're doing it as a coach or as a leader because you've just lost it and you've had a tough day and now it didn't go the way you want because this employee or this player and now you're just that's not helping any that's not leadership you know that's just you know because you know you, you get paid the most you get to blow up and yell that's mm. that's not going to help anybody you're right i think and me me sharing what i shared earlier about how i was kind of i'll use the word raised um, in, in the workforce, I actually swore up and down, and I still do it to this day, that I would lead the complete opposite, even though that worked for me. And I am grateful for going through that because it made me what I am. But even when I started running framing crews of my own and, and leading guys on my own, I kind of got a lot of respect, and everybody wanted to work with me because I was the complete opposite. I was not a yeller and a screamer, and I always swore up and down I would never do that to guys because it had happened to me for so long. And I guess it's almost, I almost do it almost now to a fault, I would say. But the one thing that I try to do is let people make their mistakes on their own and then explain to them, one, this is the mistake that you made. Here's how you fix it, and this is or, or why you made it, and this is how you fix it. And then let them fix it. And – when you're framing houses or something like that, if a guy builds a wall the wrong way, upside down, and blisters it with 10,000 nails, yelling and screaming at him ain't going to do any good. But if you go up to him and say, hey, man, pay attention next time. This is what you did. Here's a nail puller I'll see you after lunch. Mm -hmm. He's never doing that again, ever. Right. And right. I try to do that here. I'll let these guys kind of make mistakes on their own, sometimes even knowing that they're going to make it. Yeah, and then try to correct it later, and then you know, let and let them do it, and then right. nine times out of ten, that rarely happens. But when it does, it doesn't happen again. Right. No, I think you're exactly right, and that's what a true leader is. You know, a true leader isn't a yeller. He's he's not necessarily a quiet guy. He's a your job as a leader is to, to make everybody around you better, true. right? To, to to help them grow and help them become better, or whatever you're the leader of. And, and, and to me, part of what you're saying, and we're saying the same thing, is that honest feedback, you know? So just being the nice guy and not yelling, but not giving any productive feedback uh, to, to the employees, to the players, to, you know, uh, you know, to the people that you're leading, you know, is just as detrimental. You know, to say, hey, you know, I don't want to ruffle any feathers. I don't want to make Ben mad. I'm, I'm not going to say this. Well, that's not helping Ben and it's not helping the organization. You know, at the end of the day, my job. So sometimes it's tough. And, you know, those those talks, those, you know, those, you know, uh, the, 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 to be able to communicate with the people uh, is, is that's where you see the leadership, you know, is, you know, being able to have those conversations and have them such a way that when that person walks out, that player, that employee, whoever it is, that they have a plan going forward. You know, nobody likes to get kicked in the gut, but if they know at the end of the day that you're behind them and you believe in them, and this is the path that I need to do to fix it, to be better, that's what we do as leaders, right? You know, that we we give them a path and hopefully that they'll, they'll follow and become better for it. Nice. I wanted to ask you about something that Ben showed me and he's told me about this a couple times. Um, actually, you shared one with me this morning. You tell a story to all the guys in, at every game. Mm -hmm. I think that's awesome. 
No notes. What's that? Then and, I, and no notes. Like you're not there, like reading your notes as you're talking. No, about so notes. it's you know it's 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 not easy. You know to you know you, we play 56 games. It's not once a week. It's four or five times a week. Uh, I learned it from my mentor Skip Bertman, who I mentioned earlier. And uh, right before the game, 15 minutes before the game. Uh, now we do it 20 minutes because there's a little more pregame type stuff that we do. We pull them together. We go through and review the signals uh, really quickly. And then I tell them a short story and it's something that, you know, I've done since I've been here. Um, uh, I got a lot of stories now. I try, uh, now I've got them all in books and, and try to, and I put them by year so I don't retell the story. Uh, so you're talking about, uh, I guess, That's even with hard, an degree, I can figure out it's, you know, 200 plus stories uh, to, to go through, but pick ones. Uh, that I think are pertinent to where we are. If it's handling adversity, if we just lost a game or two, if it's if it's you know remaining consistent, and you know uh, if it's not being overconfident, if it's whatever the you know to try to pick a story that and it like I think you know to be honest with you like with all motivation, uh, the mistake that some people get I think as leaders is how am I going to capture all forty players and you can't it's impossible. You know, it's, it's, you know, uh, but what you're trying to do is to make motivation important and you, I'm going to get five today and I'm going to, you know, with a story in their locker or a message or a quote or a video, you know, and so they're constantly getting the motivation from different areas, you know, that you're going to reach all of them. I'm not going to reach everybody every night with that story. Uh, but I do know they appreciate it. And part of it is somebody that coached in your program years ago is mentioning it to, you know, his, his partner now uh, that players will come back and mention a story. They're, they're listening, you know, they're, they're, they're hearing it. And so um, it's worth it. It, it. it does take a lot of work, but it's part of what we do. And again, we've talked earlier about, it's not just all the X's and O's, right? It's some other things uh, that, that augment the program uh, that, that, that help us be successful. Sure. I think one of the other things we've recently started to do that he's also kind of related to similar things that you guys do as a team. We started a book club. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and then we read a book every month as a staff. Any guess what book I chose coach? I'm going to say energy bus. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. It's a terrific, terrific book, but it's, it's been cool. It's been a, it's been a good bonding thing. And, we do a review every month before our monthly discovery day and we all get in the conference room and talk about it and talk about the things that we liked and that we didn't like. And Ben chose the energy bus. He said you were a big John Gordon fan. Yeah, it's uh, we, we started that. I, I can't remember when might have been around energy bus may have been the first one, but I, I've chosen I've chosen a book every uh, winter break when the kids uh, leave for Christmas. They have about you know four or five weeks you know at home. Uh, Again, they're, they're kids 18 and 22 years old. They're not dummies. They're not just the typical dumb jocks, but again, probably not on their, you know, expectations is I'm gonna go home for Christmas and read a book, right? Um, and they just finished a semester. So we try to find one that's not super long and easy read, something that, you know, they, they uh, even if they procrastinate, they could crush it in a day or two uh, if they wanted to. And we, we ask them about it. It's not just put it away because part of, part of the reading, I think, is, you know, when you talk about a book club is to be able to discuss it. So it puts a little pressure on you to, to finish the book, right? My wife's in a couple book clubs and, and I'll see her like she needs to finish this book because she's going to go to this book club meeting and she can't sit there and say, I didn't read it. Right. Even though you don't get a grade, even though you don't get a report card. I mean, you, you don't want to be the dummy sitting at the table. You know, even if it's a bunch of guys having a beer, you know, you don't want to be the guy that didn't read it. Right. right. And why are we even doing it? Yeah. That guy back there in the computer, and or you can't <laughs> you can't even talk because you didn't even read the last book, Don. <laughs> but the point is, you know, it's 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 a good healthy thing because again, I think it's a way to start that dialogue, right? To start sure. that communication, and how does that relate to us? You know, as an organization, as a team, and that's why I do it. I I, I read the books obviously beforehand. I'm not going to go give them something and go, man, that's that book stunk, or you know, hey, you know, they had a lot of messages that I don't really like. And so, you know, over the years, sometimes it's harder than others. And so, I read a lot. Uh, well, I guess that's uh, opinion. I I read probably one book a week 
maybe one a week, one depending on how big. And you read a lot. Comes. I was going to say I would consider that reading a lot. <laughs> yeah. So one one a week, sometimes one every two weeks, depending on how big or what's what's uh, you know uh, what I've been doing. You know, sometime when I'm down at the beach, yeah, I mean, I may read a couple a week. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I started to read to be honest with you because all the people that I considered smart read. You know, and I, I'm I'm still not a good reader. You know, I, I, I'm not. I mean, I just I never learned to be a, a super proficient reader, and uh, don't think I have a great vocabulary. But then I got to the age of, I don't know, mid 30s, and I started to realize that most of the people that I respect read books. They'll say, "Hey, man, I read such and such," and I'm like, "Man, I haven't read a book since like college." You know, like I never, I don't know if I've ever read a book on my own that I didn't have to read. And so uh, I started to do it and, and you know, really just found my niche. I couldn't read. My wife reads at nighttime. I, I'd read like one page and fall asleep in the bed. I'm That's like, me. I can't do this. So I found my niche. What it is, is I wake up in the morning. I'm not as crazy as you guys, but I wake up at six o'clock every morning and I usually put the coffee on and I read for about 45 minutes every single day. And, uh, and so uh, doing that you know, kind of puts me in, into a routine where I read and I've really, uh, enjoyed it. And I, I, you know, I think it's awesome. Uh, I, I, I don't, you know, most, it's all almost all nonfiction, a lot of biographies. It's either I, I go back and forth, like I'll read a biography and then I'll read a kind of a self-improvement book, you know, and I kind of flip back and forth, you know, each, you know, each one. I, but, feel, like, uh, I feel like it's trend, trending right now for more people to start reading. Like you, you start to see people talking about books again. And like you said, there's, thousands of leadership books and you know biographies and things of that nature but i mean matthew mcconaughey just wrote one you know what i mean everybody's like yeah why am i gonna listen to this actor and now they're like wow that was kind of cool and you see like all sorts of people from different walks of life like yeah reading again i yeah. feel like it's trending. especially if you're in, a, in a, the business of leadership and, and that one it kind of either reinforces a lot of what you do you know, because yeah, their terminology, the way they explain it may be a little different, but you can say, hey, that's similar to what we're doing. It, it certainly can bring some ideas. One of the reasons I love biographies is because, you know, it, it tells you their story, which is interesting, right? But then also through that, it may reinforce or give you some ideas of what you can do as a leader, right? Because most biographies, right, they're, they're about either star athletes or stars, you know, in, a, in an industry. Uh, or, you know, a historical figure. So there are, they were all great leaders. You know, so when you, you know, talk about that, it's it's kind of a story and a self-help book all mixed into one, yep. you know, if it's done right. Well, Coach, we always try to end every episode with three questions. Uh -huh. um, the first one is, is, what is the best advice you've ever received? Wow. It's kind of a loaded question. It is... Um, and I, it, it, again, I, when you're not prepared for it, you know, off, you know, off the cuff, um, people to my wife and my, uh, my father both take credit for this. So when, when I was, uh, graduated from college, I was the first person in my family to graduate from college. And, uh, I didn't think I wanted to be a baseball coach. I went home, got Ben kind of knows this story. I was a failed finance planner. I went back home, got a job, got my Series 6 license, got a job with First Investors Corporation in Tampa, Florida. I made $15.46 in the first two months of work. So it didn't take me long, Don, to realize I was going to not be a huge success in the financial planning industry. <laughs> but I remember my my future wife, it was my girlfriend at the time, and my father used to say, like, why, why don't you want to be a coach? Why don't you want to do that? And you know, I always thought you know, it was too hard. Like I watched other guys that wanted to be coaches and watched their movement. It was, uh, but I remember them saying, why, why are you so sure that you won't be a success? Like the University of Florida, University of Georgia, they're going to hire a baseball coach. Why are you so sure that you won't be that guy, you know, eventually? You know, when you were a high school baseball player, you were so sure that you were going to play college baseball, but not everybody makes it. Why are you so sure? And when they said it that way, I started to think about it and said, you know, what am I scared about? Like, sure. you know, what's the worst that can happen? I mean, I know I can be, you know, maybe I won't ever be the head coach at Ole Miss, but I can be a good high school baseball coach, or I can be a good high or junior college baseball coach, or I can you know, make it somewhere. 
And so, you know, I think a lot of times our, our fears and, and, and what we kind of been programmed to kind of take the easy route or to, we think, especially as a young person, we have it figured out and we really don't, um, you know, but that was you know, the best advice is that, you know, maybe you should, you know, you're not, you should just for it. The second, second one you, you kind of answered already. We literally just talked about it and it's, do you have a morning routine? And you said you read a book for 45 I do. minutes every morning. I, awesome. uh, I wake up most most mornings uh, uh, at 6 o'clock, regardless if I'm on vacation or somewhere else. Uh, towards the end of the year, there's not as much sleep. I, it's hard to get to 6 o'clock. Uh, I'm usually up somewhere, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and this is not to be the macho grinder guy. Hey, I'm up at 4 th- I'm up at 4.30 just because I can't sleep. It's not because I want to you know, watch more film. <laughs> I wish I could sleep more. Uh, but I think that's just the nature, you know, uh, of what I do. And, you know, when you care a lot, you know, you wake up and you, you're older, you have to use the restroom and you lay back down. You just can't go back to sleep because your mind's spinning. But most days I'm up at six. Uh, at, again, I because of my job, I've learned a long time ago that the, if I'm going to see my children regularly, and I have five of them, uh, that breakfast is the best time uh, because I get home at all you know uh, hours of the night at home on the road recruiting and all that. So a lot of times I didn't see the kids before I went to bed. Uh, they were already in bed, but I knew that if I woke up, and uh, so I was always been the, the breakfast guy, you know, making waffles and cereal and not super giant breakfasts, but that, you know, at least even as teenagers, when they weren't very talkative, at least I could see their face and sure. ask them about their game last night or, or what have you. Uh, but that's always been my routine. And then the last one is uh, what book are you reading right now? Um, I'm reading, uh, and I'm almost done, uh, almost finished it this morning, a book, a, a biography, uh, of Don Larson called the perfect Yankee, uh, who, as you know, I think you would know, he threw the only perfect game in world series history in 1956. And so, uh, um, uh, yeah, that's what, that's what I'm reading right now. Awesome. Love it. Coach, thank you for the time, man. This was awesome. This well, really thanks cool. for having me. I enjoyed it. And, uh, you know, we love Ben Fleming. So, uh, whenever we can do anytime Ben calls, we're, we're there. We got to put the pressure on Don to get to Swayze and I guess yeah. to get back to Swayze for sure. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's not that hard. You just got to <laughs> jump on a plane or get in the car and get over here. Cause Hey, I know somebody <laughs> that can get you tickets. So good point. Your uh, uh, Cammy can get us tickets. Perfect. Got good it. point. You're, you're good. <laughs> Coach. Thank you again. I appreciate it. I, thanks guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Till next time, guys.